So we're going to go to the end of the Gospel of Matthew today where we hear Jesus' final words to the disciples, at least in Matthew's uh, account. And I'll be reading from the 28th chapter. Uh, you can follow along. Uh, you'll see the words printed on the screens as I read. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them, I have received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And look, I myself will be with you every day until the end of the present age. This is the word of God for the people of God. And God's people say, thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Come Holy Spirit. And breathe life into the words of this servant, that they might carry a word from you into our hearts and lives this morning. Amen. Congratulations. This is your day. You're off to great places. You are off and away. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. At least some of you, I know, recognize those words as the opening lines from the timeless and well-loved classic, Oh, the Places You'll Go, by the legendary Dr. Seuss. That book uh, is often quoted around this time of year. In fact, it shows up at everything from preschool graduations to med school graduations as little nuggets of wisdom about life that is ahead <clears throat> and in speaking to the transition that people find themselves in. <clears throat> what a wonderful thing. And so today we celebrate our seniors and it's important to do that because this is a really big deal. It's a milestone in their journey of life and faith. And so to stop and say, take notice, because things are going to change now. It's an emotional time, right? <clears throat> I remember as our kids were getting to that point, Shelby, and then a few years later, Sid, particularly for Sid, because people knew that at that point, we were going to become empty nesters. People would come up to us and say, H how are you doing with the kids leaving? You've had that folks do that to you as you've had one leave in the house before, right? H how are you doing? And we would say, well, you know, we, we love Shelby and Sid. And I mean, we're definitely going to miss having them around. But after all, this is what we've been preparing them for, Right. I mean, you nurture them, and you love them, and you raise them, and you hope you equip them to be ready to go out into the world. Go into the world. That's the message that we hear today from Jesus to his first band of followers. Go into the world. And at this moment, at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, something very significant is happening. A transition. And the relationship is now taking a seismic shift. This is where the disciples are given a new charge and a new responsibility. For three years, they have been in sponge mode, soaking up everything they possibly could from their rabbi. And perhaps they had anticipated until just a few days before this that he would always be with them. But then the cross comes, and they know that will not happen. But here he is 
back with them in this moment after his resurrection. And what's clear from his words to them today is that he has great expectations for them. Make disciples, he says. Baptize. Teach. And just like that, these followers of Jesus see their role change from students to practitioners. They will now be the ones to take up the work that he had done primarily before, and now they will become the primary bearers of the good news of God to the world. And they won't just do that in that little community where they find themselves. No, Jesus' charge gets even bigger and bolder. He says, you're going to go do this all over the world. Go and share this with all nations. And in those few words, Jesus seems to be showing a surprising level of confidence in these 11 disciples. I mean, let's remember, after all, that just a few days before this, they have all cowered in fear. One of their comrades has betrayed Jesus, and that's why we get that startling news at the beginning of the passage today that it is the 11 and no longer 12. And of the rest of the 11, None of them have exactly stood up courageously at the foot of the cross. And now here they are back with him, and Jesus is telling them to go out and change the world. Nothing could have possibly prepared them for such a moment like this, that they would be the ones given that kind of responsibility. And so Matthew tells us that When they see Jesus in this moment, they worshiped him, but some doubted. I love the hypothesis that theologian Stanley Hauerwas has offered about this part of the passage. He says, perhaps at that moment when it tells us that the disciples doubted, it's not so much that their doubt is about Jesus, They see Jesus, they know he is right there in front of him, and they know the kind of person he has been. Where their real doubts lie is in themselves. They know how they have already fallen away and how they have failed him in the past. How could they possibly do what he is asking them to do now? And so it's not surprising then that they would have doubts for no rational thought process process could have led them to believe that they could do what he is asking. And yet their doubt does not free them from the responsibility that Jesus assigns them. And besides, this is no rational enterprise anyway. The confidence that they will need as they go out is not confidence in themselves, but confidence in the one who is sending them. And so he offers two words of assurance so that they will know they can do this and it will be okay. The first thing he says is, remember that all authority in heaven and on earth has now been given to me. What Jesus is saying in that moment is, because of the cross and the resurrection, because I am standing here before you alive, here is the evidence that there is nothing that I cannot and will not ultimately overcome. And if you are following in my way, the same will be true for you. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And then he tells them the other words of assurance 
and comfort. Remember, I am always with you. Every parent who sends off a high school graduate says that in one way or another. Not that we're physically going to be with them. Goodness knows they don't need us to do that. But a reminder that our love never fails. And so Jesus, in a tender, loving moment, says to the disciples, Remember, I am always with you. And remember, they must, and they certainly had to have listened to that word about his authority because all of a sudden, as we read the story, as we begin the book of Acts that tells us about what happens after Jesus has ascended, suddenly these disciples are courageous and bold and take up the movement and indeed accomplish more than they ever could have asked or imagined. And what starts with those 11 becomes a movement and a mission that changes the course of history forever. Go into the world, Jesus said to them. And they did. These words have come to be known as the Great Commission. And you know, that Great Commission was not meant just for first century disciples. The Great Commission still goes out to those who would be followers of Jesus in the year 2017 as well. And here is the great tragedy that for too many of us who do church, the great commission has become the great omission. And we have failed to take seriously the call of Jesus to go out there with boldness and with courage and with passion and with love so that the world might see Jesus. So what would it look like for us to take up that call, for us to say yes to the Great Commission and to go? Well, I think a good starting point for us is to remember an earlier place in the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus tells the disciples and all who are within hearing distance to be salt and light, to be salty, to add flavor to the world when you go out into it in such a way that people are curious what makes you the way you are, to shine the light of God's love in the way in which you interact with other people, to be salt and to be light. Mark Laberton is the president of Fuller Theological Seminary out in California, and he has written a great book entitled Called, The Crisis and the Promise of Following Jesus Today. I would commend it to any of you, and it's a quick read and a great read and one that will encourage and challenge you in your own response to Jesus' call on your life. He talks about this idea of being salt and light and gives a lot of different ways in which we can impact the world and be about the business of making disciples. One of the things he talks about is a place where many of us go every day, and that is the workplace. Listen to just a few lines from his book about that. At the very least, our job is a setting for our call to live and work as a disciple. We go to work called to speak and act as someone who follows Jesus. The integrity of our work, the honesty 
and diligence of our labor, the commitment to fairness and justice, the intention to serve with humility and competence, these are all outgrowths of embracing the responsibility of our workplace as a Christian. Now, for those of you who are no longer working or have gone into retirement, there are other places where you go on a daily basis where you can practice some of those same traits and characteristics that Labradon talks about. Humility, compassion, fairness, justice, integrity, all things that we see in the life of Jesus that we are called to take up in our own lives as well. Being salt and light. So let me offer a couple of other ways in which I see we could begin to be salt and light. Just a couple of examples that occurred to me this week as I was thinking about this idea. And the first thing that occurred to me is last week, you, if you were here, you will remember that point in the service when Catherine invited you to stand up and to pass the peace with one another and to look each other in the eye and to say to one another, peace be with you. So I got to thinking, what would it be like for us to take that practice beyond the church and out into the community? And when you have interactions with other people, as the Spirit leads you to perhaps end an encounter, rather than saying goodbye or so long, what would it be like for you to say to another person, peace be with you, as a sign of offering shalom, as a way of being a peacemaker in the world, because the world needs peacemakers. Those of us who want to live in the light of God's love and grace and walk as Jesus walked. Peace be with you. I wonder, I wonder how people would begin to respond to that kind of offering of ourselves. Then a second thing that occurred to me was thinking about the places where we live, our neighborhoods, the streets that we live on, and the other apartments or houses that are around us. You know, surveys suggest that these days, many of us do not know our neighbors very well. In fact, some surveys suggest that people cannot even tell you the names of the people who live in the six dwelling places closest to them. So what would it look like for us to be serious, to get serious about being good neighbors, to get to know the people who are in close proximity to us, and to show a level of care and concern about who they are and what they do and their family life and their needs and their medical issues and their concerns? How might that begin to help us form friendships with people in such a way that they would want to know more? They would want to ask us about our lives and want to know more about who we are and why we are the way we are and allow us to speak good news into their lives. Simple things, they don't demand too much of us, I don't think. And when we begin to take simple steps, then we begin to open ourselves up to the possibility of taking bigger steps of being willing to have courage in sharing ourselves with others in ways that let them see Jesus. And friends, I think that in the 21st century, this is absolutely essential. 
for the church. Because I am convinced that the primary places where people will choose to become followers of Jesus in the days ahead are beyond these walls. We may still come here to gather for worship and for community and for fellowship and invite others to come and be here with us, but the primary places where people will make the decision to be a follower of Jesus is not sitting in here. It is out there because of the ways in which we show them Jesus through our lives. And so, I say to you this morning, get going. I say to you, congratulations. This is your day. You're off to great places. You're off and away. You have love in your heart and good news to share. And the people who need to know are out there. So go. Let's pray. Oh God, give us courage so that we might respond today as your followers have responded across the generations. For it is through us that you will reveal to the world the love that you have for every one of your children. So may we rise up and go wherever you lead. Amen.